Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vehau Inside Business. I am Nick Peterson, and joining me today is the Chief Growth Officer of N26, Alexander Weber. As Chief Growth Officer, Alexander is responsible for the international expansion, marketing, and European markets. His emphasis is on driving the business forward and writing the next chapter in N26's growth story. Graduating from WU Vienna and studying at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, he holds a degree in international business administration and discovered his passion as a founder eager to solve significant global scale problems. Alexander, welcome. Welcome. How are you? Thank you for having me. Very good. Thank you. Now, first, to kind of zoom out for those that are not as uh, into mobile banking, what is neobanking? And what yep. is a neobank in general? Yeah. So neobank uh, is, is thought of as, as, a, as a bank that was started from scratch in the last probably six to seven years that um, really focuses on delivering a banking experience for the smartphone. So if you think about what happened in the last 10 years in terms of consumer behavior, there was this big shift from offline to online to mobile across various industries, like the way we book our travel today or listen to music. It's not the same like 10 years ago. Uh, and banking sort of this hasn't happened until recently. So there was still a lot of branch based banking and Internet banking going on. And neobanks have taken that to the mobile level, really reaching customers in, in their expectations of what a good user experience looks like and really redesign banking for the smartphone. And of course, this is going to be disruptive to the financial industry. Are the traditional banks, you know, are they getting a bit scared by this? And are they following suit? How are they reacting? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, right? Like whenever something new starts, it takes some time for incumbents to recognize that um, as, a, as a threat potentially. In the beginning, it's, it's, it's ignored. And then over time, as it grows more and more, it, Sometimes it's ridiculed and at some point, basically, it becomes the role model. So we've observed almost this change where, you know, two, three years into our inception, no one was really paying attention to us. And then after three, four years, everyone started talking about, you know, how do you actually create an experience as simple and as easy as N26? Um, if you think about it, traditional banks have really struggled with, with pivoting their experience to mobile first because of a lot of this IT legacy that exists with traditional banks, because of the branch networks that exist. Um, and so it's very, very difficult for them to, to pivot to such an easy and simple experience when you start a bank from scratch with that in mind. Um, and therefore, it, it definitely is a significant threat to the retail-based business of, of, of traditional banks. And we see that already now. We have um, acquired more than 8 million customers in just, just over six years, right? And, and that speaks for this shift of of you know, consumer uh, interests and behavior towards solutions that really are easy, flexible, and, and mobile at the end. Gotcha. And full disclosure to our audience, um, I am an N26 customer, and I do love it. <laughs> so Good. not to, Great. but I wonder, what do you see um, banking as in the next 10 years? You know, what, what will be the shift? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a famous quote from Bill Gates, I think at some point was, you know, banking is necessary, but banks are not. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I think the, the boundaries between, you know, the, the interface where you, where you cover your, your banking and your payment and, and your everyday life will become more and more blurred over time, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. ideally payments and taking care of these things is seamless and just enables you to do what you're actually intending to do as opposed to a payment process being being friction, right? So when you think about wearables, when you think about um, NFC payments and so on, I think the whole payment space is already getting much, much easier and more embedded into just sort of your actions independent of taking financial decisions. Um, nevertheless, I think in 10 years and in the next years, we will see a lot more internationalization of banks and harmonization across borders, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about it five to 10 years ago, and even today, still predominantly in every country, there are different banks. Yeah, There is not an international bank, a European bank. We, we were sort of the first bank really operating across all of the European markets with one license, one infrastructure, one team, mm -hmm. you know, um, leveraging a lot of the synergies that result from that. Uh, and I think we will see more and more players going more international as regulation also becomes more international. Mm -hmm. Reducing borders also for a society that is much more international, traveling a lot more. Um, and so I think those are some of the major trends, right? So the internationalization trend, the trend of 
uh, removing friction and making it as seamless and easy uh, for, for consumers. Um, I think those, those are two of the main trends that I would, I would see. And, you know, I, I have to ask, just as we're talking about the future and, you know, recognizing what's going on now, how will cryptocurrency play a role in this? Fascinating discussion. I am um, personally very interested in, in the technology, in the use cases, right? I mean, if you really dive into it, cryptocurrencies is just one use case of the blockchain. We've observed huge emergence of NFTs in the last year in, in, the, in the context of digitization of, of, of assets, of music, of, of art, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it is still very early and I think people are still getting getting acquainted to what a future could look like based on, on, on these technologies and these, these, these topics. What you can observe now is that, you know, it's, it's the fastest adopted technology that's ever existed. So I think when the internet came up, it was adopted by like 60% year on year. We're talking now around about 113% of people year on year now starting to go into, into cryptocurrency. So I personally think that this is a huge, huge adoption curve and it will mm -hmm. play a, a very important role in the, in the years to come. I see customers also now in Europe specifically with, with a low interest environment here to stay, really understanding that it will take something else to, to build wealth and sort of just saving every month something and putting it into a savings account. So we see massive movement of customers moving into equity markets, trading is becoming much more of a of a theme also in Europe, right, which in the US has been more present, but in Europe, not so much. Um, and, and also movement into into the cryptocurrency space. So mm -hmm. at N26, we're working on enabling these these categories for our customers. Um, but sort of what exactly the future will bring and how sort of cryptocurrencies will will change the entire financial ecosystem, I think would be a bit too early to make some some predictions with confidence. Gotcha. Well, and I mean, I want to pivot to your personal experience. Yeah. I mean, how did you start at N26 and how, you know, what events at N26 really were the, the critical moments that shaped your career path? Yeah. So I was very lucky um, early on in my career, uh, even before my career started, actually during my, during my studies to discover my passion for entrepreneurship. I think mm -hmm. you know, this is eight years ago, nine years ago. So startup wasn't as big as it is now, especially not in Europe. I was studying in Vienna, as you said in your introduction, and um, most of professors and colleagues were very focused on traditional career paths and consulting and banking and these things didn't really resonate with me. So when I was in Australia and, and had the pleasure of meeting a lot of US exchange students and, and other people who were already into the startup scene, it, it really hooked me. And I, I knew I wanted to go into that space, start my own companies. Um, but I also recognized that I don't have to start my own company to embark on this entrepreneurial profession, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, and so decided to join something super early stage, take a risk, see what happens. Um, and, and by coincidence, that was uh, number 26 back then in its infancies. Um, so joined when we were seven people overall, pre the first customer, um, pre launching. And, and the, the, it comes from the Rubik's Cube, right? What was the significance of the Rubik's Cube? Yeah, yeah so, so the name, the name N26 comes from the Rubik's Cube, yeah. you're right. So the Rubik's Cube has 26 cubes. And yeah. the analogy is that a Rubik's Cube, which looks very complex at first sight, yeah. if you actually understand how to solve it, if you apply the right strategy, you can solve it very quickly and easily. Got it. Right. And if you understand payments and banking and you can make the complex very simple, you can mm -hmm. also deliver a great, great experience. That's very much what we stand for at N26. And uh, that's how it all started. But back to back to your yeah. point, like th that's how I initially joined N26, sort of really saying, let's let's choose an early stage startup, let's see how it goes. Um, and very quickly, I knew that we were onto something. Um, and then, you know, seven years went by. Um, so a lot has happened in that time. Time flew. Um, but yeah, very, very happy that and grateful for that opportunity. And, you know, this entrepreneurship feeling definitely at, at VEU has a very significant you know it, it covers everything and we have a new program the masters in entrepreneurship um it's you know we pride ourselves on on producing and, and fueling the spirit of entrepreneurship i guess what would you um what advice would you give to a fresh graduate from this program in on you know of course learning entrepreneurship from a, a traditional university is already kind of a, uh, an interesting ironic statement in I its agree. own but yeah. um what advice would you give to these graduates just before getting to that advice, I think mm -hmm. personally, you know, having gone through business school without any focus on entrepreneurship, I think it is a very, very 
positive move that just awareness is increased so significantly because I strongly believe that, you know, uh, our future depends on a strong generation of entrepreneurs, not the, the, the couple of few that we hear about, right? The Elon mm -hmm. Musks of the world and the Steve Jobs. But we need, we need a, a generation of entrepreneurs who will address some of the most meaningful problems we have ahead of us. So yeah. I generally think that raising the awareness and, and sort of bringing it more and more into business schools, making it a, a career opportunity is, is a very good development overall. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, I think the key advice, like if you're really early in your career, finishing university, this is the chance, right? To take risk. You don't yet have most likely um, family obligations and mortgages and, and all the like, which later on often is reasons for people not to take a risk and go all in yeah. and, um, and the like. So personally, you know, when, if not now, are you in a position to take a lot of risk, go all in, try something out? Um, I, I think, you know, that would be my advice. Don't don't follow that convention that, oh, you need, you know, four years of consulting on your CV before you can take a meaningful role in a startup, because I think all depends on, on you. It all depends on you learning the things that are relevant in the startup. And, you know, if consulting helps you to learn that, fine. Um, mm -hmm. But go and take some risk, be bold and, you know, fail a couple of times. You can still then go into consulting or the more traditional path. Gotcha. And I, I guess we'll close with, you know, one question I always like to ask our guests, which is, what are you reading? Like, what, if, what book, if you, you know, is there a, or a publication, what is it that we should, you know, maybe uh, students have not been aware of a uh, different kind of newspaper, magazine, or a, a book that you would recommend? What should we, what should be, we, what should we be aware of? Love the question. I, I, I read a ton. Um, I think the key advice I would give here is, you know, find the things that have stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. that we are bombarded with content. Here's the latest blog. Here's the next newspaper. I think the key thing is find the big books that have stood the test of time, mm. uh, right? Where, where the wisdom is, is, is generation over generation true. Identify things that teach you the first principles of how this world works, right? And, and don't follow the latest fad and the latest bestseller and these kind of things. So, um, you know, maybe two books that have really shaped me that I think would, would um, fall in that category. The first one is uh, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm. um, which really teaches you just a lot on yeah. being proactive, taking responsibility for your life, um, many things in that regard, which I think just is a mindset that, that is super important no matter what you do. Um, the second one is from, from Ray Dalio, Principles, um, which is really a fascinating, Ray. right? Ray Dalio, one of the most successful great. hedge fund managers of the world yeah. who really is known for like philosophy and, and, and explains these first principles. I think so anything that gets you closer to understanding how nature works, um, you know, study, study microeconomics, study mathematics, logic, uh, different things in that regard that, that really are the foundation of, of everything. Uh, I would highly recommend as opposed to, you know, following the latest business advice from someone who's not, I mean, also always check your sources, right? Someone writes a business book, but has never built a successful business. Why would you read it? Um, yep, naturally, of course. Well, guys, you heard it here with Alexander Weber. Thank you very much for tuning in to Vehu Inside Business, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me.